Given the scale of the large map, both its traversal and time management are cleverly implemented. Damage sustained causes max health loss and can only be restored through sleep. It's a double-edged blade, but if you really get down to the meat and potatoes, it makes absolute sense. If it could be easily mitigated by items like in Dogma 1, the max health loss would be obsolete. This in effect is a smart way that incentivizes players to utilize sleep functionally outside of passing time. Only that is subjective considering that players could possibly see mandatory sleep as an annoyance. The various camping spots do a great job of mitigating the need to be in towns for sleeping purposes. Though I only wish we had a more in-depth recipe system as opposed to a simple tier system for cooking. Given that Dogma 2 is on PS5, I wanna fry some fish, add some spices or maybe even some dinner accents. Even the very first Monster Hunter game had an ingredient system, so I see no reason as to why we're stuck with simple one ingredient choices. Nevertheless, the various buffs provided from cooking does an immensely good job of subsiding the soul-crushing difficulty of the early game. Faster stamina recovery, more health, cooking has it all. Another mechanic which I won't state is completely mandatory, however the game tries its utmost best to have itself utilized or ox cards. See the thing is, fast travel points reset after a new game. This way the game ensures ox carts will be used most of the time, coupled with the fact that fairy stones are rare and expensive to come by. Ox carts do a great job of mitigating travel time, however be prepared when dozing off as boss and enemy encounters along the path are nothing but infrequent. Let's break down combat, vocations, and boss battles. The first aspect worth noting is the stamina system. The first game was much faster in gameplay. Like, much, much faster. The first game had iframes, and most importantly, the first game had complete regain of stamina outside of sprinting, skill executions, blocking, levitating, and of course, the grab. Here it is somewhat similar, but basic actions that do not consume stamina affect its regenerative speeds. If your stamina is down, walking decreases regain speed, walking uphill decreases regain speed, jumping stops regain entirely, dashing stops regain entirely, shooting arrows stops regain momentarily, Shooting magic bolts stops regain momentarily. By now hopefully you understand when I say this game has a more realistic weighted feel. Not only in terms of slower gameplay, but every action has consequence. The first game, things were lighter, they were faster, and mistakes were easily forgiven and mitigated. Dogma 2 on the other end, with the omission of iframes and the inclusion of what I call soul crushing staggers, one mistake will leave you stunlocked into absolute oblivion. Just like in Ori 1, your only hope in this predicament is that you get a miracle in the form of an opening to escape. That is, if your pawns don't come to your rescue. I solemnly believe that the reason this game allows you a brief moment to heal yourself once your health reaches zero is to survive stunlocks until an opening appears. To mitigate constant opening of the inventory however, we now have item shortcuts and the most effective of which is the lantern. Shortcuts did exist prior but only on keyboards. Here we have them thankfully mapped on controllers as well. However, my only critique in this regard is not having an option to set shortcuts in the first place. Instead we generally have healing mapped on the up button and stamina as down. But as soul crushing as it may seem to be indefinitely stunlocked, the mechanic very neatly falls into a hard to learn, easy to master category. To explain why I do not believe staggers are as bad as I am describing them to be, is that one needs to train themselves to not get in the middle of those stunlock entanglements in the first place. I'd like to make the use of a metaphor in this instance. I love the Rambo movies. They're a great piece of fiction that tells the story of a man capable of some insane, violent 
combat feats, even infinite ammo. Throughout the Rambo movies, Stallone's character is made out to be a man capable of defeating the most menacing of enemies. So when Rambo travels to rescue Gabriel from the Mexican cartel, he confronts them head on and is severely beat down. Rambo is a killing machine, but he's no superhero. It makes little to no sense that he would walk directly into an ambush of about 50 goons with any chance of winning. So the burning question would then be, why would Rambo ever get himself in a position where his chances of victory are slim to none? The answer is, he shouldn't. Just like Rambo being an effective killing machine that shouldn't put himself in danger's way, players can and should be reactive enough to not get themselves severely ambushed despite being able to dispatch enemies with ease. However, a goblin being able to stop a level 70 sorcerer from the incantation is borderline ridiculous. But that's just where the beauty of Dogma 2's combat becomes poetically synchronous. With the realistic, more weighted and much slower animations present, your button presses then become strategic chess movements instead of haphazardly mashing away. This is where I think Monster Hunter played an even bigger influence on Dogma 2 than it did in the first game. The inventory system and combining mechanics were ripped straight out of the iconic Rathalos slaying franchise. But Dogma 1 took into account more of DMC's combat and Ori's shooting than Monster Hunter's weighted gameplay. This is what I was referring to earlier when I said I believe Kobayashi-san took Dogma 1's faster gameplay along with his departure from Capcom. Dogma 1 had players running around as watered down versions of Dante or Nero in an action RPG, meanwhile Dogma 2 slowed things down to a more weighted gameplay experience approximated to that of the Monster Hunter series. The weighted gameplay that had existed in the very first Monster Hunter whereby a single step left you with a noticeable stopping animation. Dragon's Dogma 2 does the exact same. Every movement and action will cost you a few frames down to each and every single step. But despite the new stamina system, stagger and impactful actions, combat is still a fun experience overall. It just might not always converge well with players who were expecting an upgraded version of the first game, me being exactly one of those players. But a new inclusion I do in fact cherish is the finisher and the ability to kick down shields. Enemies that have been staggered are susceptible to an awesome finishing move with the press of triangle. Lifting an enemy and sending it flying with the greatsword is an absolute epitome of satisfaction. The same would go with rending an enemy's guts with a stab and flush of the daggers. Or even interestingly enough, a shoryuken. Unfortunately, ranged vocations do not have these finishers for obvious reasons. Eh, I wish we had a Judan Sokotogeri on archers and a staff smash to the face on mages or sorcerers. <laughs> but what comes with finishers is a great soundtrack and monster roster to complement those finishers. In respect of my earlier statements about a smaller monster roster and the omission of hard rock, Dogma 2 in and of itself is still not bad in either of those regards. Only when based on comparison to the first game, it doesn't necessarily do any of a better job, but by no means not any worse. My main detraction with the first game's soundtrack was a lack of variety within general combat encounters. The soundtrack would only alter based on the level discrepancy between players and that of enemies. So what does that mean? The higher the level of the enemy, the more intensified the corresponding soundtrack will be. However, once you reach a high enough level, you'll never hear the high intensity version of the soundtrack ever again due to enemies not being a higher level. On the flip side, each boss had their unique soundtracks that always culminated with the dramatic end of the struggle theme we are all so familiar with. We of course have the new and improved arranged version of End of the Struggle titled Reversal of Fate. This soundtrack might probably be one of the greatest additions to the argument of viewing Dogma 2 as a superior product over the first game, but for all its astounded nature, we'll get to it later. Dogma 1's soundtrack was epic, orchestral and hard rock. 
Unfortunately, both rock and variety of soundtracks has been left out of Dogma 2. While rock music was part of the initial design concept along with jazz, it was the submissions of Monster Hunter 3rd composer Tadayoshi Makino that steered the soundtrack in the direction it went. Just like Kobayashi-san's departure, there is the possibility that Makino-san's absence may explain the lack of rock music present. Either that or Capcom simply refused for the electric guitar to return, all implied to establish a new identity for Dragon's Dogma as I mentioned earlier. But what also didn't return in Dogma 2 is the wide array of bosses and monsters in the first game. Look, I'm very much open to humoring the argument that it shouldn't be a fair assessment to compare both Dogma 1 and Dark Arisen's enemy and boss roster to a base level Dogma 2. But we have to remain honest, two console generations later should have definitely have such a large discrepancy in enemy types mitigated by a considerable stretch. It's great that we can now fight Gorgons, a giant snake-like enemy and… and… damn, there's really not much here. <laughs> Hydras are gone, cockatrices too, no wavens, no worms, living armors, I'm sure by now you get the idea. And what happened to all of the snakes? The RE4 and 5 snakes that populated Granzis and Bitter Black Isle all seem to be missing in Vermand and Batal including Ori4's bird nests. Instead we have the same old same old, wolves, bandits, goblins, saurians and harpies. These can't be the only things dangerous on the roads. I want some tigers, some bears, maybe even some alligators or eagles, heck even some moose will do. But hey, that's just me. All roads may lead to Grand Soren, but this time all detractions lead to one of two words, lazy and rushed. With the various set pieces on the table, we'll most of the time be fighters, mystic spear ends, archers or whatever vocation we are tackling this minute roster with a limited soundtrack across the beautifully designed map. And while we're at it, let us dive into those vocations, shall we? Not much has changed in the way of selecting vocations and gradually upgrading their respective playstyles. What has changed is the erosion of hybrid playstyles resulting in each vocation being truly unique and exclusive. And honestly speaking, I'm not very much pleased about the splitting of striders into archers and thieves. Look, each one of us knew those wild speculations most of us were dreaming of was most likely too far of a stretch at the time, but to not have anything beyond what was showcased is truly criminal. And who can honestly hold the fanbase accountable in that regard, when the first game had a colour system to represent basic, hybrid and advanced vocations, we thought that if there were 4 basic colours, each of them should have had their respective advanced versions and a combination of those resulting in hybrids. The trickster simply turned everything absolutely bonkers with the inclusion of purple and pink. With warriors and sorcerers being advanced forms of red and blue, we then logistically speculated to get crossbows and dual swords on yellow and green. With the mystic spear hand, we thought it was a combination of mages and spear wielders. Seeing NPCs with spears, we thought there might be a vocation to use them on a pure physical level, and still no unarmed skills. Look, I could go on and on, but we'll stop it right there. But what I do know for certain is that I'm not the only one to have thought the vocation selections were lacklustre at final. But enough about all of our big dreams, let's get back to the concrete. Most of what was expected on the vocations we got was delivered. We now have 4 main skills with L1 and a special vocation action on R1. Sight aiming for archers, blocking for fighters, a charge for warriors, dashing for thieves and strangely nothing on mages or sorcerers, though we'll get to more on that in a moment. Despite the overall gameplay being slower, fighters do tend to play more nimble. They pretty much do the same thing they did before, only there are a few skills to compensate their initial lack of mobility which in most cases is a vast improvement over the first game's static fighter playstyle. Given the ridiculous stagger amounts, fighters being able to interrupt mid knockback will have any player utilizing the shield spin as a mandatory skill. 
Like the Thief and Warrior vocations, anyone wanting to experience the most Dogma 1 style gameplay in the second game would main these vocations. Now before we get to the Archer and Thief, we have to talk about the elephant in the room. The splitting of the Strider vocation. As much as there are efforts to make Archers and Thieves unique, the only reason I could see a justification to split the vocation was to ensure a greater number in total vocations and to compensate for the new total of 4 skills. But if we really think about it, a Strider could have worked even if they decided to call it a hybrid. R1 could be for bow attacks and L1 for dagger skills, including the dash. The same could be said for a Mystic Knight. The sword or staff skills could be used on L1 and R1 for the magic shield. I just don't see how any of this could not have worked in my honest opinion. There are another two convenient reasons as to why this one weapon per vocation format was selected and we'll get to that in a moment. Archers are without a doubt my favourite in the entire game. Mainly because I personally hate fighting flying enemies without any form of reliable reach and that goes for across the entirety of video games. But one thing worth noting is that archers are by far the greatest testament of how much realism was expanded upon in the sequel. We still have rapid fire and spread shots but not nearly as devastating like in the first game. For example, a level 1 spread shot in Dogma 1 was a split of 3 arrows, meanwhile level 2 was a split of 5. In Dogma 2, a spread shot is 2 successive splits of 3 arrows and level 2 is merely an additional shot of the split of 3. This time we also need to equip skills to utilize blast arrows, poison arrows, etc. Fire one blast arrow and add another attack to set it off. This means any archer out there would need to expend skill space if they intend to use poison, oil, etc. The only exception is the maker's finger or unmaking arrow as they call it this time. Not the biggest setback but definitely one worth noting for my favourite vocation. And I'm not sure if realistic gameplay was what led to archers holding arrows in the bow hand but seeing this historic reality replicated in the game is truly appreciative. Most continuous fires will see archers hold successive arrows in the bow hand which honestly is a praiseworthy historic detail. Thief players most likely have had the least of changes. In short, like I said before, anyone who wants the most Dogma 1 in the sequel will primary Thieves. Only no double jump and instant reset will definitely have some heads turned. One particular reason I could think double jumping was removed was to not give Thieves an unnatural edge in evasive mobility or an advantage in climbing. But if it was for the sake of realism, I wouldn't buy that particular reasoning. Thieves spin diabolically faster than before but the double jump and reset was omitted? Make it make sense. On a more positive note, the addition of having the flurry on tapping square is another improvement on daggers. I only wish we had more combo options on timed presses and maybe some button holding but hey, maybe in the future. Mages and sorcerers do not have much to talk about outside of their basic abilities. Mages are supportive and sources primarily offensive. The magic system now has a boost mechanic at the cost of stamina, no detractions there. The detractions do however start at the fact that the basic blast is now less effective than before. I guess it could be considered a fair trade off in that you can now continuously blast without interruption and strafe while doing so. Added to the fact that basic blasts are now less effective, charges have no special attack form. As a result you have a much weaker magic user than before. But if we are being impartial, those effects were mostly aesthetic differences in dealing their respective damage types. The only exception being lightning with its chain attacks and ricochet charges. This is yet another reason as to why one can conclude the sequel was rushed. Respective magic types had special aesthetic effects, now they are just mere color changes to represent the respective element. A good adjustment is that mages and sorcerers can now speed up their spell charges at the expense of stamina. However, R1 is unmapped when spells are not being channeled. And for spell syncing, the camera is far too zoomed in. 
I guess players should be paying attention to the noticeable flash or pawn dialogue when syncing is active, but with all the insane happenings on screen, it's easy to get lost in the source while channeling. Though it was kind of expected to be nerfed, Sorcerer's Spell Syncing will now instead have the spell casted once as a whole, instead of each sorcerer firing an individual instance. Anodyne is now mapped to triangle on mages, and sorcerers have an ability to rapidly regain stamina called Galvanize. Honestly, I much rather would have had a Staff Bash or Magic Push on Triangle, whereas Anodyne and Galvanize could have been mapped to R1 when spell channeling was not active. To me, Capcom not finding a use for a button on mages and sorcerers that is integral to other classes is downright lazy. Just as much lazy as they omitted dark damage. Magic archers are still a unique experience overall, the shooting styles of various spells are always a nice added touch. Though the discrepancy between magic archers and archers completely disintegrates the playstyles established in the first game. Using bows and magic bows in Dogma 1 felt like combining the third person shooter mechanics Capcom perfected in the action era of the RE games. Bows felt like guns and magic bows still felt like guns, only in alien form as seen in the likes of Halo and Resistance. Though I must admit the alien point still sticks in Dogma 2. Trust me, shooting lizards with a giant block of ice is not something I think anyone that plays any RPG would ever think of. <laughs> and the same would go for trying to steady your aim after charging a ricochet. Both of them are decent and unique changes. The only issue I have with magic archers is the aim adjust on triangle. Initially you would think this mechanic is useful for targeting multiple enemies or focusing one, but honestly speaking, most of the time, the precision strike is way more useful. Like as not, we could have had R3 mapped for the changing of aiming modes while holding down L1 and still maintain the archer's kick on triangle. That being said, the aim swap on triangle is literally an excuse to differ archers from magic archers. And that's exactly what I was trying to highlight earlier about hybrids being combinations in theory alone. In the plight of trying to make each vocation unique, hybrids are combinations only on paper but not in action. Magic archer is only similar to archers and mages in that they are ranged and utilize magic. Previously, magic archers used bows, but still retained their dagger abilities. But since striders are no more, the game now has an excuse to only combine ranged and magic, but not daggers ranged and magic. You see now why I say a ton of this all has laziness written all over. The same would go for a mystic spear hand. Red and blue is supposed to represent a fighter vocation with the capacity to use magic or vice versa. This time, the red color only represents physical attack and concurrently blue represents magic utilization. And trust me, I would be the first one to highlight that the argument works the same the other way. Red and blue, close ranged physical and magical. Mystic Spear Hand does just that. But remember, this is going against the rules the first game had set in place which I highlighted before. Red and blue is supposed to represent a fighter vocation which uses swords and shields with the capacity to use magic on their swords and shields. But enough about how the logic works against the rules established in the first game. Mystic Spear End is a great addition to the vocation roster for all its intents and purposes. There is a spread of both physical and magical skills to ensure a perfectly balanced somewhat fast and tactical combat experience. All of this is encapsulated by the stun mechanic. Hold R1 long enough and you can stun mobs or slow down bosses and if you are quick enough, get up close for decent offensive follow ups. Despite it not converging red and blue into a mystic knight, as a vocation on its own, everything is splendidly well done and does fit the mold of close combat with magical capability. Now. The trickster, I believe, is the true highlight of Dogma 2's vocations in its entirety. The reason being is its sheer wealth of unlikeness comparative to anything we've seen in a Dragon's Dogma game. Imagine you were playing Final Fantasy XIII. You have a party composed of a commando, medic and synergist. 
What that means is you have high physical damage, a healer and someone who buffs the party. Now if you place that into Dragon's Dogma 2, you have a trickster. Only you're not a player behind the screen issuing commands, you are an actual participant confusing enemy ranks and keeping yourself out of harm's way. In my opinion, that's the simplest explanation I can give of a trickster. It truly allows you to sit back and attentively hold enemy focus while your pawns deal the significant portions of physical and magical attack. If you are quick enough and your timing is accurate, a trickster playthrough will have you witnessing Dragon's Dogma 2 as a turn-based RPG while remaining a real-time participant. I have yet to witness another action RPG experience with having the AI do most of the work while I'm an active participant. That is in fact the trickster vocation. If you ever want to just sit back and watch a game play itself, yeah. I honestly do not know how differently I can put it. I decided to save the warrior and warfarer for last because unfortunately there isn't much to say. Warriors are still slow but at least this time they have a heightened resistance to stagger. I cannot for the life of me imagine trying to play warrior and getting staggered as badly as other classes given the vocation's lack of defense, evasion or speed. This is where timing your strikes to get faster combos is honestly an amazing implementation. Think of the Arkham games when you need to time your presses to get higher combos. That's basically warrior with faster swings. Be it basic sword swings or skill charges. Warfarers are universal in skills and equipment but sadly it's one stamina costing skill for swapping weapons in real time but not skill sets. Honestly, you would think that skill maps would change based on the weapons currently equipped, but nope. Any skills are simply disabled until you have the respective weapon equipped. I guess it could be considered a fair way to balance warfarers, but considering we only have 4 skill buttons and one is needed for real time weapon swapping, in total it's actually 3 across all weapons. Still, it wouldn't be completely fair to dismiss the warfarer as bad based on limited skill slots as I have seen some amazing combinations possible. At that point it's up to your imagination. With having one weapon locked to each vocation, having to do quests in the way of unlocking advanced or hybrid vocations, having to fulfill certain quests for the ultimate vocation skills, each vocation truly feels unique rather than advanced versions or combinations. Save for mages and sorcerers. Why I believe that vocations are now a double-edged sword is due to the fact that this completely erodes what was established in the first game. The unfortunate reality is, some players just won't adjust well to the change of not having daggers alongside bows, and others will miss not having magic on shields or daggers. Given that now only 4 skill slots exist, I don't think we'll ever see weapon combinations ever again besides warfarers. But hey, that is what it is.